Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is an art historian, curator and manager. Marion Ackermann is her name and here she is in person. Hello. Thank you very, very much for joining us here today on Talking Germany. It's a great pleasure and a privilege. Now, uh, Marion Ackermann is a hugely influ influential figure in the world of art here in Germany, not least because she runs what is viewed as one of the country's best art museums, that is the Kunstsammlung Nordrhein-Westfalen, or in English, the art collection of the German federal state of North Rhine-Westphalia, which is to be found in the Rhineland city of Dusseldorf in Germany's North West. Marianne Ackermann, first question. Uh, your museum has been described as Germany's, and I'm quoting here, secret national gallery. Is it that good? Yes, it is. <laughs> I, um, it has one of the most beautiful collections worldwide, but it is not a huge collection. So um, our founding director, Werner Schmalenbach, always said it's quality, not quantity. Um, and so you must imagine he he started in the year 61 to acquire works for the state of um, North Rhine-Westphalia and he had in the first two years 20 million Deutsche Mark mm -hmm. um, in these times, so 61, 62. Um, that and was he, a lot of money that, back then. That yeah. was a lot of money, so it was the biggest budget mm -hmm. inside Germany in these times. Um, but then he waited for years to find the best Picasso, to, to find the best Kandinsky. And so we have an um, excellent um, Paris-based mm -hmm. um, collection of European modernism mm -hmm. um, with really um, main works of the artist or very unusual works of them. You can see in, 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 in there's no other museum where such, so like um, Modigliani, we have portraits of Modigliani and they are so special. So mm -hmm. he had really um, a very good view on the art. And then he collected very early American modernism. You must say, to, in a way, many years before MoMA started to collect. Yeah. Um, and he always said in German, out of the Portokasse. So it means so with little money. Yeah. So it was very cheap in these times because it was fresh. So he acquired Pollock, the most famous Pollock of the world. For, Jackson Pollock. Yeah, yeah. for mm -hmm. very little money. Um, and so, yeah, with this uh, density of quality, yeah. we are ex exceptional. Okay, I've got the message. You've got a very, very high quality collection, as anybody who, who has been to your museum will know. I've just got one thing. You talked there about the MoMA, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's it. That, that in the modern world, it's very, very important that museums are branded, mm. that it's very easy to talk about them. And when you talk about the MoMA, that, the MoMA that's iconic, yeah? yeah? Your museum, and I'm going to repeat what I said earlier, is the Kunstsammlung Nordrhein-Westfalen, or the art collection of the German state of North Rhine-Westphalia. It's not, as some journalists say, sexy. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we ha there was the try um, to to use the names K20, K21, mm -hmm. um, and we use it widely in the world. But the problem is that um, when you want to have um, famous artworks from other collections, they know this difficult word Kunstsammlung North Nordrhein-Westfalen. <laughs> if, even you, if you can't spell it in English, yeah. um, I don't know why, but um, then they trust us. So it's something like, I don't know. So it's really difficult to reduce um, the different names we have to one brand. Mm -hmm. But we, I would confess we still have to work on it. Okay, dokie. So maybe a little bit of rebranding is necessary. Tell me about you as a museum director, as a museum manager. What makes you different from other museum directors in a nutshell? Shell. Um, I, I'm still I'm uh, widely supported by the state or county of North London's failure, so I can acquire, I can still acquire, so I, perhaps we are the, less, the last museum in, in, in Germany uh, who really can um, work on the collection. Um, so you can go out and buy? Yeah. yeah, I'm totally independent. So we are a foundation, mm -hmm. but we have full support by the state. So yeah. this is a great mixture of so a balance where you have you are free. You can nobody is talking you in and uh, trying to influence you. Wow, 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 wow. We're, we're <laughs> going to have to talk about that in just a yeah. second. That sounds like I mean I said at the at the beginning you're very influential and very powerful. You certainly are from what you're telling me. We've got to talk about that in detail in just a second. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about you when you were a very, very young girl. There was there's one there's one fact that I read that was that I thought was very interesting. You grew up in a family like mine, I have to say, that didn't have a TV at home. 
Yes, that's true. Yeah. In a way, it's a disadvantage because oh. um, mm -hmm. I would say um, so film and video and moving image is so important for our time and from mm -hmm. the 20th century. But um, yeah, it was like that. <laughs> Let's just go. We've, we've got a couple of photos of you from, from, from those days back then when, when you were, I don't know, let's, let's have a look. Let's see the photos. Um, there we go. Yeah. What can you remember there? How old were you there? Um, I, I, I think four or so. Four, four or five. Yeah. It was in Ankara and I'm standing... Oh, this was in Ankara because you lived in, in Turkey, yeah? Yeah, I left in Turkey. When, when, we, when I've been two years old, we um, moved to Turkey mm -hmm. from seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I grew up there. But there's this fascinating detail. There's a, ah, there's another one. What, what, what are we seeing yeah. there? That's Turkey too, I would guess. Y yes, it's yeah? Turkey. And you can, can see that uh, we have these special shoes as children. because It was very hot in summer, so mm -hmm. it's a continental climate. Yeah. But uh, because of um, the snakes, so my mother was so always... the snakes? Yeah, my ah. mother was so anxious mm -hmm. that we had as kids had always <laughs> wear. <laughs> interesting, interesting. You mentioned your mother there. There's this yeah. story that your mother was a very pragmatic woman. She was teaching at the university and she would take you along and leave you at the back of the class and, <laughs> yeah. and say, right, you're doing art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in a way, so my mother was really highly talented. Also, she was painting and drawing every mm -hmm. day and so it was so difficult in Germany in this in these years to for, especially for women to she wanted to go her way and so my parents left Germany to be more free really yes and uh -huh. uh, so through the um, uh, DRAD is a German academic ex exchange program they yeah. could both teach at the university in Ankara mm -hmm. Um, and from my mother, it was possible to combine it with family. Mm -hmm. So she she was working full time every day, and she was taking us always every day with her. And so we grew up in a very relaxed way because in Turkey, the people have been very open. So mm -hmm. also to kids, of course. But yeah. um, so I think this friendliness of the Turkish people I will have forever in my, my memory. Wonderful, mm. wonderful. I'm a big fan of Turkey and Turkish people as well, I must say, yeah. so I share that with you. Uh, and this, this experience of being with your mother, of being, uh, of being set the task of doing drawings and paintings, did that have an impact on, is that where it all began with you being the person you are, going into the world of art, studying in this direction? Yeah. It was both. It was really seeing my mother living for the art, and oh, yeah. but the other uh, the other thing was perhaps her her story. So she uh, she came from a, from a quite rich family, um, um, and she lived in Kleve, and mm -hmm. Kleve was bombed out during the Second World War, and so the family of my mother they lost their um, house and the villa, really villa, and all the material things they mm -hmm. left all things and after the war she was f uh, 15, 45 and uh, she um, was living for um, the arts and for the spiritual things and she always told me only the immaterial is important. That's very, um, that's very interesting, you're talking about how your mother responded to art or her relationship yeah. to art which is something you learned from her. Yeah. We're going to talk about you going out and acquiring it, purchasing art maybe. Just tell me this, when, when you, when you are in a room with an artwork, be it a painting on the wall or whatever it is, yeah? Do you respond, when, when you're enthusiastic, do you yeah. respond physically or do you respond intellectually? Mm, physically, oh. first, I would say. Can you say. describe that? Um, you, in a way, you are excited, so physically excited. So um, it doesn't happen too often. Mm -hmm. Um, that's good, perhaps, because then you really feel you're <laughs> It would be too much to hope for, for it to happen every day, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And, but very often it is uh, uh, also followed by doubts. So the first reaction is very intense, mm -hmm. and then the intellect is starting to work, and you're thinking about it, thinking, and very often then you have doubts, because normally you have this reaction when you have seen something new, mm -hmm. what you didn't know before. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it comes, like the questions are coming, is it really good and what, how can I explain it? And, and, and so this is a quite long process. And so when you never forget it, so when you're thinking for three, four years about it and you can't get it out of your mind, yeah. then I think you have something you know that, that there must be something which is That's really very good. interesting. And I'd like to follow up on that, the, the whole sort of the way you respond to art. Because you said something which I thought was interesting. You said making art is about 
You said, making history perceptible in exhibitions. Okay, so far so good. Mm -hmm. You also said it's about highlighting the questions being posed in the present. Yeah. What are the questions being posed in the present? Mm, that's difficult to answer in one sentence. Yeah. But You've got um, time. You've it, got time. It means, um, for, for example, when you when you are working with artists, everybody knows. Kandinsky or Malevich or Alexander Korner, so, so the stars, the heroes of the modernism. Your heroes. My heroes, yeah. we can say. Um, and um, you ask yourself, what is when a person of 18 years or 20 years coming to the museum, what could be interesting for this person? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it can be something which is very political, a real question which is very um, important uh, concerning society and politics, but it could also be in a question concerning what aesthetic uh, aspects like Alexander Calder was uh, so much influenced by um, experimental music and this was really radical in these times in the 20s and 30s which he did and um, it is not known and so we we try to to realize a Calder exhibition which mm -hmm. you can see at the moment mm -hmm. in Düsseldorf um, and you can uh, you can hear the sculptures are producing sound and it's very radical and I, I see that the young audience is so much interested in. Um, it can be another project, Kandinsky Malevich Mondrian. There have been so many exhibitions about these heroes of modernism. But um, nobody asks ever what white means. There are more than a thousand pigments. So we, we are questioning what is white paint. Um, <laughs> that is interesting. And, and the German language doesn't have words for it. Yeah. So in some northern languages, you have more words for, mm -hmm. words for it. Um, and and my, so my thesis, so I can say, I'm telling the audience when you when you can't see the differences between the subtle shades of white, you you are not um, uh, you have no chance to see the universe. So do um, you know what you, what I mean? So okay. um, to to make them more sensible for yeah. things of our actual world. That is my aim. Fascinating. What a mission. What a mission to have in life, making people more sensitive for, for, for subtle shades of white. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Now, uh, we're going to talk in just a minute about an exhibition, an installation, that is, that has been causing a bit of a sensation and a lot of excitement at Marianne Ackermann's Dusseldorf Museum. <laughs> And the name of that is, uh, as we've seen, in orbit. Yeah, you have to put a white suit on. Have you have you had one of the white suits on? I presume you have. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is um, a question of security that uh -huh. nothing can f fell down. So. I see. And how does it feel to be up there when you were? You, have you been there more than once? I mean, you, you must have spent more than the sort of the, the normal ten minutes up there. Yeah. Yeah. What is very interesting for me, it depends on your daily condition. Oh. So it, it makes you more, it, you're, it's an unstable situation and it depends on how you are on the day. So it's, every day it's different. And this is what Thomas uh, Zaraceno uh, wants. He wants really to, to change the people. He wants to bring them in an, into another condition. There we are. We have a photo. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's me. <laughs> it's a proof that I was on it. <laughs> I did believe you, though. I did believe you. Yeah. Uh, I know what a lot of people will be thinking. That, that question that you hear so often, that you probably hear so often, is it art? Yeah, of course. We had a public dis discussion on this. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Playgr playground or utopian uh, Gesamtkunstwerk. Yeah. Um, but um, so uh, here you have to, to de deeply dive into the thinking of Thomas Saraceno and his, mm -hmm. his whole work. So, mm -hmm. And you really understand that he's one of these artists of the younger generation who is again speaking about utopian ideas. That's, for me, it's very fascinating to see that since two or three years, the talking about future mm -hmm. is coming back again. Mm -hmm. um, and so the title, the first title was a citation from Malevich, from his Manifesto for Suprematism. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the Russian artist Kazimir Malevich, let's pin Russian this artist. down, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, something to, to have something like a um, utopian idea that you are leaving the earth and going into the universe mm -hmm. and... Um, and, and, and Thomas, he, um, um, 
he also wants to have this uh, social experience. When you are going into um, the installation, you feel the movements of the other people. Mm -hmm. And so you feel you only come to a higher level when you're doing something together. You feel the vibration and so. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and then the spiders are very important as a model. And there are social spy types of spiders mm -hmm. and, and semi-social types. And mm -hmm. they're producing different forms of, of webs and nets. And this is for him... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Something like a visual model for the artwork. You've got me wondering whether I'm a social spider or a semi-social <laughs> spider. I don't know what the answer to that would be. Uh, you have told me you have a budget, mm -hmm. yeah? And you could, in theory, go out and buy a Paul Klee or a Kandinsky. Have I understood? Mm. Uh, On paper. Because, <laughs> yeah, because that's, <laughs> that's the problem, isn't it? Because the, yeah. the art market is out of control at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you've got a relatively fixed budget. It might be a generous budget. Yeah. But what can yeah. you do with it? So it's, it's impossible now to continue to collect um, so these expensive works of modernism. What you could do, you could uh, collect female uh, artists. Uh -huh. But um, when you take um, the famous female artists, Paula Modersohn, Becker, German mm. artist, very brilliant artist. Um, in this case, the, the best works are already in public collections, yeah. so you have no chance. So you can still acquire American modernism, so I just could acquire Agnes Martin mm -hmm. and Ed Reinhardt. Um, but the better thing is also how much, to, do, how much did you spend? Can you reveal this to us? Some, must... mil some millions, okay. in every yeah. case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but it's it's much better also to to think about contemporary art and um, yeah. and perhaps um, artworks who are not so much um, influenced by the market. They are still brilliant artists. Which they still are, exist. Still exist, mm -hmm. which you can't find in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, not producing works for the market. And I think it's important for the public museums to concentrate on these artists. Oh yeah. Now. Uh, the art world, Germany, Jewish communities worldwide and many other observers and commentators all have been rocked recently by the discovery of a huge trove of artworks in a Munich apartment. Many of the pieces went missing during the Nazi period. Now, if they were put on display together, the paintings and other works would certainly be an eye-catching exhibition. The question is, though, uh, who do they belong to? Mara Nakaman, there are so many different ways we could talk about this story. I'd like to try three different levels. First level is just what's your response to the find of the century, this bizarre story, totally unexpected? Yeah, yeah it's a sensation. We are all discussing it since two weeks. Um, it's, for me, it's very sad that um, there was a lie um, that uh, the whole collection was burned during the bombing of Dresden. Yeah. And everybody believed it because, you know, Dresden This was, was the story that the father, yeah, the father Gerlitz Senior, put out. You know, yeah, all, the, the, all the paintings were destroyed in the yeah, Dresden fire. Yeah, yeah. and um, so you can fear that there are perhaps other lies um, of other stories because, because you, can't pr you can't prove it in the moment. And mm -hmm. now there's this collection and um, we have to see um, yeah, what, what to do with it and if, we f if there have to be owners found and, and mm. doing re research now with the committee. Yeah, and, and you're, a, you're a bit of an expert on this kind of thing because we, we saw the story about the, the, the Ludwig Museum in, in, uh, in Cologne. They had to return a Kokoschka. That's yes. an interesting story. Have you been involved in those kind of restitution stories as well? Give us an idea of sort of what the parameters are. Yes, because our collection has so many um, works from modernism. Um, exactly. Of course, yeah. there's this so, is the period. This is the period. We have 128 works um, where the which it was not clear, totally clear, what between 33 and 45 happened with the works, and so we had we, we are doing for 10 years already provenance research, mm -hmm. and since four years very intense with four research, three or four researchers, and now uh, we reduce it to 33 works, mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, in, in th two or three cases especially we are doing a lot of more research uh, to find out what was going on, but um, it is difficult because um, the archives in Paris or London, um, they are often closed or material is destroyed, and mm -hmm. it's very difficult to find out. It's quite a tortured position for you to be in, effectively sitting there, being in holding works of art that may it may be may, may be proven that they are stolen works of art, that they're works of art stolen from Jewish families. Of course, but we have one case um, where we have um, questions from three sides. Yeah. You can't. Um, 
divided in three parts. So you have to do really intense um, research to find out who was the right owner. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complex story. Yeah. Given that you've been doing work on, on restitution, yeah, and giving an awful lot of thought to that, and you're also an expert for, for the classical modernism of the 20th century, people like Paul Klee and Kandinsky and all sorts of other people. Try and answer the next question for me, which is, and this is a, an, another level upwards now, is that uh, Germany created so much wonderful art in this period, but Germany was also so hateful mm. of this art at one and the same time. How does that, you know, how do you explain that? Hmm. So um, it, uh, the um, 20s have been very radical in German expressionism and, and this new media, film and, and early forms of performance already. And so very, very radical period. Um, but the society perhaps was not mature enough to... So it was something in the Weimarer Republic. It was a very, Weimar Republic, yeah. Weimarer Republic was a very um, special situation. On the one hand, um, many um, strong traditions from the 19th century still, and on the other hand, this avant-garde. Um, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's a long story how it was possible that um, the, in the Third Reich um, the things could, could uh, be cut up. So from one year to another, there was such a cut. Yeah. The development. Just to go back to the Munich story, mm -hmm. the, the authorities there are now talking about returning a, a large quantity, possibly, of those works of art to Mr. Gerlitt, yeah? yeah? Does that surprise you? Does that shock you? Does that seem plausible? They are speaking about about uh, 300 uh, yeah. works. Um, I know it uh, from the media as you, so mm -hmm. I, I haven't known the collection before, so okay. we all have been surprised by it. Um, I, it, it has to be, um, it, it's always the question if you ask the lawyers um, or if something like a commission which are um, uh, deciding on a more ethic, uh, ethical basis. Ethical basis. Ethical basis. Yeah. So, and we have in, in Germany these Limbach Kommission. It's mm -hmm. a group of people. Um, there's one art historian and uh, they're coming from different uh, fields of society and they're deciding together on this ethical basis. And that's the question. It's more a loyal question uh, or is it more? And it's too complicated that I can give you here an answer to it. We have to wait some other weeks and months, but uh, I know that they just founded a task force, a, a group of people who are only concentrating on this um, case of Gorlitt. And I think they will start in the next days or weeks. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it took a little bit of time, but, it's, uh, but they've got there finally. Yeah. Let's change the subject a little bit. Um, do you jog? Joke? Or do you jog. Know? A dog. Ah, oh yes. I, I not not in the, in the traditional way. So I, I, I'm I, my son is seven years old, yeah. <laughs> and he loves it to to jog. And so I started with him. Oh wow, that's good. <laughs> Do you go to the movies? Um, it's it's a problem when you're working so hard and have family. So that's where that's I'm the going. First yeah? thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I'm going. Do you cook? Um, I'm not a good cooker, so I'm oh, coming you know, from cook. a more feminist tradition of my family. <laughs> so my mother, my grandmother, and my and, and before that nobody could cook from the female. <laughs> and that's what you call a feminist tradition. Yeah? Do you, you you live on the River Rhine, yeah? Doesn't yeah. it? Do you go for walks along the Rhine? Yes, of course. It's beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Place. I mean. I, uh, You'll find out in just a moment. You might be wondering why I'm asking all these questions, and you will find out. It's got something to do with detective stories. And just about... <laughs> you laugh, you might, yeah? And just about 40 kilometres down the Rhine from Dusseldorf, where Marianne lives, is the city of Cologne. It is the first city in Germany with what I suppose you might call uh, a detective story dispenser. We had that report on the show because of you, because of Marianne Ackerman, because, because there's a rumour going around that you're a big fan of detective stories. Yeah, yeah what is a strange thing is that many art historians um, love uh, crime novels. Really? I don't know. Yeah, it is. I don't know why, but it is that's, a fact. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I can't explain why, yeah. Uh -huh. I like it too. Uh, I'm trying to fit this together now because we discovered earlier that the that the art world is still a male-dominated world, yeah, yeah, at least true. at the top level, yeah, yeah, like so many areas of German life. Mm -hmm. I was on the underground this morning, yeah, coming into work, thinking yeah. about you, of course, and um, and there were two people sitting opposite me, both reading what were quite obviously detective stories. Mm. 
One of them was an American detective story, one of them was a Scandinavian, very popular at the moment. You probably read Scandinavian. They were both women. Mm -hmm. I wonder, it, it, are detective stories a, a women's thing? I don't think so. You don't think so? No, and many writers are also male. I so no, no? I don't know. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't agree. Okay. I know many male readers. <laughs> you just gave me an idea though, because uh, have, you, have you read the English detective story writer Kate Atkinson? No, I haven't read it. Ah, right. Yeah, I have promise to. me, Good. read Kate Good. Atkinson. Promise, yeah. And I'll tell you what one of her stories is called, because you were just saying that, you know, people in your business, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like detective stories. Yeah. It's called Behind the Scenes at the Museum. Ah, yes, yes. Ah, I, okay. So it is like a crime novel, what we are doing at the moment with um, these, all these stories. With very true, very this, true. Um, there's one thing we must do before we get too near to the end of the show. Uh, we like to ask our guests to bring along a prized, a treasured or an interesting possession or an artefact. You've brought this along, yeah? Um, explain to me what it is, first of all. It is a cutout, so it is um, a razor blade. You can see a razor blade out of paper um, and it's, it's in the colour pink, um, in a very fluorescent colour. Yeah. So, um, you see quite small. Uh, and in a plexiglass box, yeah. which is closed, you can't open it. Okay, now, you're, you, you, give me some points here now. You, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and interpret what I've got in my hand, yeah? And you tell me whether I'm interpreting it right. Now, there's a... Maybe this is about irony, because it's a razor blade that is made of paper. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're Not laughing really. at me. You're laughing at me. Yeah. Um, maybe it's about transparency because it's in a little box that you can see into. Mm -hmm. mm. Not really, no. Not really. Uh, maybe the colour pink is significant? That's, that I would agree, yes. Well, and the colour, I mean, you know, pink. Well, well, you tell me, what the, what is the colour pink about? So, um, I can tell you what the artist told me. Ah. <laughs> it is an artwork. It's a yeah. small artwork, not, not, not big enough for a big art market, but it's an artwork. Nice and transportable as well. Nice yeah. and transportable, <laughs> <laughs> as many of the best artworks have been. And um, so the artist Simon Periton from, from London, um, he told me um, when Eve Klein mm -hmm. would have born in our times, yeah. He would have taken pink as his colour. Instead of the Eve Klein blue, blue. the legendary blue, yeah. Blue, which, which meant opening of the, the sky and so. And, yeah. and, and he said, uh, pink is the colour of our times and of the colour of the future. And I like it so much because it's like a symbol for what art can do. So he's cutting, mm -hmm. and he's doing cuts, so he can be political, he can be, um, yeah, change something. And, but at the same time, it's a very aesthetic thing. It's very nice, beautiful. It is. It's a lovely um, little object. And it's um, so a cut out, so everybody can do it. Yeah. So it's, it's a very simple They're thing. They're very fashionable these days, aren't they? Cutouts now, yeah. Yeah, they came back. So it's really fashion now, yeah, that's true. OK, I'm very, very grateful indeed for you bringing that along. And I've discovered now that um, not only are there many shades of white, but also that pink is the colour of our times. Okay. Uh, it's time for our quiz. Quick questions, quick answers. Abstract or figurative for you? Abstract. Ancient or modern? Modern. Uh, <laughs> no surprise there. No surprise. Uh -uh. Clay or Kandinsky? Kandinsky. Do you want from painting consolation or confrontation? Confrontation. Uh, <laughs> no. Are art museums temples or playgrounds? Oh, <laughs> nothing. No, I would say in between. In between. In between. Uh, temples and playgrounds. Okay, great stuff. Thank you. <laughs> That's your lot with the eloquent and... Uh, entertaining Marianne Ackermann telling us all about the secrets of colour. There's uh, more Talking Germany, including my blog on our and, and our archive on our website. If you've enjoyed today's show as much as I have, come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>